We are going to get started. Um, so my name is Haley St. Dennis. I head up the Just Transitions program at the Institute for Human Rights and Business. We're a global think tank working at the intersection of business, finance, government, civil society, and trade unions to advance rights respecting responsible business around the world, not least in the context of climate action. And the private sector has a really big role to play in Jet Peace, so that'll be one avenue we get into today. And I want to thank everyone for joining here. I know you have 70 other things, literally, that you could be choosing from. So we're very grateful to you for spending your time with us for the next 90 minutes or so. See if we can keep you around that long. Um, likewise, thank you to the many joining online from vast, vast time zones. And thank you to our co-hosts and our partners at the Ford Foundation, the African Climate Foundation, Climate Policy Initiative, and Laudis Foundation for today, and really for all your work advancing climate action and all the complexities therein. So this is a conversation on the J and the JET-P. So we're honing in specifically on South Africa and Indonesia, the first two partnerships, also the most advanced now in terms of their implementation. And we have, I think, a pretty mixed audience here. We have, I think, some that are probably deeply expert, really, on the pretty intricate mechanisms involved in these partnerships. And I think others that will be quite new to the, to the concept, potentially, let alone those mechanisms, but deeply committed to climate action or in climate finance or in other ways. So we'll take a bit of a whistle-stop tour through how these two countries have approached operationalizing their partnerships through that specific lens of justice and equity commitments that are at the headline of these partnerships. We'll try to demystify this emerging climate finance model, what it is, how it works, and what are the implications for people, positive and negative. More fundamentally, we will explore how each has approached this question of driving deep, fast, hard emission cuts, early coal closures, rapid renewables deployment, all while balancing that against the other two legs of the stool, energy security and poverty eradication. And it's important to emphasize that at this point in time, these just elements, I think, have been overlooked by the philanthropic community, funding a lot of energy transition work, as well as public sector funding to date. These socioeconomic factors that we're going to be talking about are only beginning to be embraced and grappled with. And so these are entirely experimental approaches to reform the way markets work and view this world, how they measure impact, how investors, philanthropies, and governments work together to ensure whatever financial flows go into JetPs are done in accordance with social and environmental safeguards. And despite that, I think we're also seeing JetPs increasingly polarized in dialogues on just transitions. They're often positioned as either the greatest innovation we've seen in years or the worst facade you could imagine. So this is not that kind of conversation. This is a principled and pragmatic discussion about the solutions required, the complexities and trade-offs involved, how to meaningfully include those that are directly affected in the planning and decision-making process, because that is how these transitions will be judged as whether or not they are just by the workers, the communities, the indigenous groups, and others most affected. And we have some artwork here over in the corner that I wanted to point to that comes from six cities around the world that we've been looking at, including Jakarta. And they paint a vision of the future that uh, university artists want to see. And I also encourage everyone to stop by the South Africa Pavilion to see a pretty incredible tapestry that, that takes a similar approach. And let's bear that vision in mind as we get into this discussion. And it's also a final point worth contextualizing. Welcome, everyone. Come on in. That I think the bigger conversation is also where JetPs sit within the global climate finance picture and the fact that these two countries in particular are really at the vanguard about how we mobilize finance, huge amounts of capital on the one hand, and how we seek to ensure the social impacts of climate action are as fair and equitable as possible. And there was a session that just finished on the 75th anniversary of the UDHR this year, and we heard from a range of human rights activists who said that if we don't have climate finance, we don't have justice. So arguably, these two tenants are really where the COP process is at the moment, 
and both are essential. We don't have enough of either yet. And I think the collision of those two is being felt directly in jet peas. But at some point it'll be felt in all climate finance. This will be an inevitable conversation for anyone committed to mobilizing finance and just transitions. And so while I don't think anyone on this panel will say that the approaches have been perfect, there's a huge amount to learn from, the progress each country has made in a very short period of time, and also the challenges they're working through in real time, and that's a very important point to emphasize, is this is happening as we go. So these learnings are just as useful for developed countries, or for any country really, looking to secure a major climate finance deal with strong social commitments. So without further ado, we'll jump right into our program. Um, we were hoping to have a, a bit of an exciting uh, speaker announcement in the form of South Africa's Environment Minister, uh, Barbara Carisi, who unfortunately has been pulled away into the Just Transitions Ministerial. Uh, but we do have Indonesia's Deputy Minister, Pa Ramat Kaimuddin, uh, Deputy Coordinating Minister of Maritime Affairs and Investments in Infrastructure and Transportation. If you could please uh, take the podium, we'd love to hear some opening remarks from yourself on the importance of the J. Thank you, Heli, and um, good afternoon, everyone, excellencies, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to be here, uh, get an opportunity to share a little bit about uh, JetP story in Indonesia. Of course, later on, um, my colleague Edo will be able to tell you more in more detail uh, about the journey. Uh, but I think what we can say is, um, the JetP journey in Indonesia was launched last year, uh, around the same time as COP in 2022. Uh, and at the time, Indonesia host uh, G20, so we announced it in, in two places. And it has, it has been a very interesting, incredible journey, and I would say it's very valuable. We learned a lot about our in, uh, energy system, and there's a lot of work that is done and I would say that um, in Indonesian process, it really shows that co international collaboration between government, between other, like, you know, the global north and global south is possible. And we also involve a lot of uh, organizations like International Energy Agency, um, UNDP, uh, World Bank, ADB, and many, many others like that I cannot mention. Literally hundreds of people are working from all over the world to try to solve this very, very pressing issue. Of course, energy transition, we speak about technicals, we speak about financial, and most importantly, also the just. You know, we believe just, the J, is a critical part of energy transition. And therefore, we need to ensure that just energy transition doesn't mean only energy transition, but it also mean fair and equitable energy transition, because the word just, unfortunately, may have different meaning. So with that, I would like to maybe share a little bit of story uh, that at least help us uh, in Indonesia guide what, what it means to be just and why we believe Global North and Global South cooperation and support is needed. So you imagine if there is eight siblings who inherits a box of 3,000 pieces of diamonds. So therefore, everyone should get 375 pieces each. The eldest, being very creative, very entrepreneurial, start taking the inheritance, selling it, use it as a working capital, and start a business. And it's doing very well. So every time he needs more money for more capital, he starts taking more from the, uh, from the box. More and more and become more and more successful. And of course, when you see your eldest doing that, the youngest also do the same. They start taking the diamonds as well and start using it as a working capital. Such that at some point, it's only about 400 to 500 pieces of diamond left in the box. And then you start seeing that the box, bottom of the box, and then in the bottom of the box, there is a writing. It says, if we run out of diamonds, everyone dies. You know? So this eldest uh, sibling said, hey, everyone stop. <laughs> everyone should stop taking. 
during that time, he only take 1,000, much more than the 375. So, you know, I think it's only fair if the elders who have taken much more than the fair share provide support to the youngers who have limited opportunity to sell the diamonds themselves. I think you already get the gist of the story. There's eight billion people in the world and the first billion have probably enjoyed much more than the fair share of the carbon budget. So to be just, the rest of the people should be able to pursue the path of prosperity too. If low carbon path is required, people need to be supported with opportunities, with capital, with technology to achieve that. So safeguards, of course, is very, very important. But in facing climate crisis, we live on the same home, and therefore we are family. We have to support the developing countries so they can get their fair share of the economic opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul Ramat. That was um, some story. Um, next, can I please invite Salim Fakur, Executive Director of the African Climate Foundation, standing in <laughs> for Minister Creasy. Thank you very much. I definitely don't want the minister's job. Um, <laughs> and uh, I did spend time with her on Thursday, and she did say um, she's going to be very busy, and uh, she wasn't sure she was going to enjoy it, but uh, anyway. Um, uh, I thought, uh, firstly, I'd just like to um, say uh, you know, how pleased we are uh, as African Climate Foundation that uh, we've been able to pull this uh, together, uh, particularly with Lourdes and the Ford Foundation, which have been really great partners, and uh, also CPI, uh, not to forget the Presidential Climate Commission and uh, PMU. Uh, and uh, people like Edo and others. Um, this has been a very long journey, and uh, if I can remind people, in 2022, when the JetP just started, we had our first uh, uh, exchange, actually, with Indonesia and Vietnam, when you were just about to start the negotiations. And I think, I hope uh, that uh, meeting uh, <clears throat> set the tone and uh, uh, lay the foundation for how Indonesia and Vietnam uh, had engaged uh, further. Uh, as an African Climate Foundation, we also were very pleased that when we started the foundation uh, in 2020, the first big uh, area of work that we were very active and involved in is really the evolution of the JETP uh, in South Africa. There's an enormous amount to learn. Uh, it's not a finished pro uh, uh, process, and I, I want to uh, challenge people to not think of the JetP as a project. This is a mistake. Uh, this is actually a pathway process. In some countries, it is actually disruptive to the interests that uh, prevail. If we think of it as a project, we are going to misjudge it, miscalculate it. We are going to judge it too harshly. It's only two years in the process. There is an enormous amount of transformative work that needs to happen. It's not just about the energy sector. I, I want to remind, remind people that this is really about shifting the nature of the economy away from a specific type of energy carrier. And with that, you have to transform beyond the energy sector many other elements that are part and hang together with the current uh, embeddedness and path dependency on coal. So if you think of it as a project, it's the paradigm that you must remove from your head. There are a lot of people that keep talking about the funding. Okay, that's one part of it. The other part of it is a deeply a deep political process around different stakeholders. You have to bring them all on board. You can't ignore them. This is not only a project for climate activists yeah, or initiative of climate activists. We have to bring other parties on board, people that are not often represented here, trade unions, uh, also the coal companies. Uh, 
we must not also assume that the people who are doing the angelic work, which is the green companies, are also necessarily going to deliver, help deliver the just transition. They're not that's not necessarily true. And that's actually the work that you guys are uh, trying to do. Uh, the other third part of this is that it's a collapsing of a fast tracking of a reform process. So there's lots of reforms that are happening under the umbrella of the JETP that have nothing to do with the distribution and allocation of the funding, particularly reforms around uh, the regulation around uh, the energy uh, uh, process in South Africa, uh, particularly the allowance of the state for other players to come into the process, the separation of the very centralized model of delivering energy, which is uh, a monopoly, single monopoly, and how to, to, to do that. Uh, so these are uh, processes of massive social change. They're not just technology change or engineering change, social change. Uh, the people who are managing this process uh, have to work very well with groups like communities, um, a range of other stakeholders, business, labor unions, etc., to ensure that there's a pro-social approach to this, not an anti-social approach. And that's where the just aspect of it comes uh, uh, into it. A lot of the just transition focus has been by interests that are only looking at the mitigation part of it. But in the countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, South Africa, Senegal, where there's another jet we have to, we cannot allow a transition process that does not take into account the pro-social aspects, which is really around the nature and shift in the economy. Uh, who will lose? How do we compensate them? And bringing on board parties uh, that are uh, particularly uh, coal workers. Uh, and uh, we have to remind ourselves, it, coal mine is in the ground and can be dig digged out for 40 years. We've got to be able to replace an equivalent uh, ability to the jobs that are going to be displaced with sets of industries that are going to be around for 40, 50 years and even longer. That's not an easy task for any country uh, uh, to undertake. This is why I'm saying this is not a project. This is actually a big transformative process. I think that's the same message the minister would have given you because I, I've heard her talk about this. And when we talk about jobs, and income, this is not just about jobs and income, this is about also making people feel whole as communities, that there is a process around also caring for people that will be hurt, suffer, or be under stress as a result of this. For example, each coal miner in South Africa, and might be true in many other places, there are four or five other people, even in some places up to 10 people dependent on the coal miner. So you can see why you can't just talk about this from an emissions point of view. So I hope that today, you know, that you will have uh, a, a lot of meaningful discussion to take an aspect uh, of, of the just uh, aspects of the transition. I think the Minister Rahmat mentioned the international dimension. I also want to say that there's a just transition element associated at the national level, sub-regional level, and even at the level of local and household levels that we, we have to, to bring into the fore. Lastly, uh, I, I want to be able to present uh, the uh, South African Just Transition Investment Plan, uh, which was released uh, in November, am I right? Uh, and just, Minister, if you could kindly come and receive it, uh, Deputy Minister, on behalf of South Africa. And uh, it's quite a detailed plan. I recommend you don't do it so thick and make yours. <laughs> so if you don't mind, if I can just uh, present this to you. And just to thank you for, just for, for this. Yeah, thank you very much. So Haley, I'll end there. Otherwise, uh, you won't have time for your panelists. Thank you yeah, very thanks. much, Tom. Thank you. Um, so with that, let's shift gears slightly and we'll build on those opening remarks with a panel, uh, if I can invite the panelists up to the stage now. Joanne Tiza, 
Um, so we have a pretty collect incredible collection of leaders here, um, both heads of secretariat, Edo, uh, as well as local civil society leaders who have been advising and stress testing these approaches along the way. And I'll introduce each briefly as they come in. Uh, I won't read their full bios, uh, which are incredibly impressive and would keep us here all day, uh, but you can certainly look into that more. And apologies from uh, our colleague Amanda Brockbank at GFANS, who was unfortunately pulled uh, into a meeting last minute as well. So we will do our best to explore the role of GFANS through the experiences, particularly Joanne Edo, of yourselves, um, and can circle back to that. Um, but just to kick us off, Joanne, I might come straight to you. Um, former CEO of the National Business Initiative in South Africa, now the head of the Secretariat. Um, I mean, South Africa really did blaze the trail and I think established some important precedents that Indonesia learned from. So would love if, if you could take us back to the beginning a little bit of, of the JetP itself and the negotiations with the, the international partner group of governments that, that pledged the initial eight and a half billion. How did you approach these questions of sort of centering justice, equity, respect for human rights in those negotiations and then in the subsequent investment plan and more detailed work to come? Okay. Um, thanks and afternoon, uh, everybody. It, it's great to be here. And you're asking a very difficult question. <laughs> Because <laughs> memory. <laughs> because no, no, no. Because I wasn't directly involved in the initial negotiations with the international partners that led to um, that, that led to the Glasgow, the signing of, of the Glasgow Partnership. Um, I, I kind of came in uh, sort of a little bit later in the process as those negotiations were, were reaching a close. But, but I do think that there is a real issue in these JetP around how you balance interests and intentions. And that's yeah. essentially what the negotiation yeah. process is about. So I think firstly, there was a negotiation around money um, and a lot of haggling about how much was enough or not enough as, as the case might be. Um, and then in that, I think there are a set of quite important questions around, are we talking about grant finance? Are we talking about concessional finance? Are we talking about loans to the private sector? And how are you going to uh, address um, all of that? And you uh, clearly want the money from a national perspective to come in forms and ways that are appropriate to, 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 to the need. I think the second thing that was quite a big issue in that negotiation was really around what would be included in, in, in this partnership. Um, and so, um, for, for example, the issue of uh, electric vehicles and the development of the potential of a green hydrogen economy mm -hmm. were very important issues for South Africa because um, a decarbonisation drive in South Africa has to go along um, with uh, economic diversification on the one hand, with being able uh, to put in place the technologies and the industries that mean that our industries will be able to successfully decarbonize. And I don't think that that was initially as important for the international partners. Mm. So you've got to agree on, 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 on scope. You've got to uh, agree on, on money. But I think that ultimately the lesson that we learned is you do have to have national ownership of the process and the product. And when we get on to talking about the consultative issues and the justice issues, that becomes very important because you can't fix this thing at the beginning. There's got to be sufficient flexibility to be able to take on board what stakeholders are saying um, in order to be able to implement the program in a way that works on the ground, country by country by country. So, so let me stop there, but I think those are some of the issues. Well, and I'd love if we could just jump straight into that next piece, which is around the participatory approach, the very, I think, big commitments in South Africa's Just Transition Framework, um, the deal that you, you inherited when you, came, when you did come into the job and the sort of uh, process that then had to follow to bring sort of civil society workers, labor especially, okay. um, very dependent communities on mono industry in and, and really try to tackle that question of diversification. How, how did you approach that? How has that been going so far? 
Oh, okay, again, a work in progress yeah. and quite a steep learning, <laughs> learning curve. And I, I think Dr. Olver will talk about that in a lot more, more, more detail. Uh, and not great in the beginning. Mm. I think that that is an important thing to say up front, that we have been through some very steep learnings here. Um, we have an approach in South Africa where documents that get approved by uh, government and by cabinet don't get necessarily very widely. They might get consulted in chunks, but you won't have a hugely wide public consultation before there's been a conversation in government. And, and I think that the approach that was taken in the beginning of this process uh, was overcautious in the sense that I'm not certain that we shared enough with stakeholders, and so when the investment plan itself came out, they felt that they hadn't been sufficiently part of the process. But I think we've been on a course correction during this year, um, and thanks to the Presidential Climate Commission who partnered and worked with us um, along the route, we, we spent the first three months of this year, uh, three, four months of this year, um, consulting with stakeholders and constituencies and experts um, on what was in the investment plan in order to build uh, this implementation plan that will take the process forward. And in doing that, I think we've been very conscious of the need to do two things. The first is to, to, to set up the infrastructure that will allow a co-creation of the way forward together with stakeholders. And the second is to move beyond consultation into starting to look at how you get really meaningful participation. Mm -hmm. And so some of what is in this implementation plan sets up the institutional arrangements, the governance structures, we're setting up a funding platform, we've tried to bring transparency into the grant element of the package in order that you can move, move from consultation into a much broader ownership of the program, and that people can much more directly uh, influence and, and impact it. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to that, because as you say, I think there is a lot to unpack there. Um, but let's move further east, uh, to, over to Udo, uh, Pa Udo. And really same question, if you can, just take us on a little bit of a journey, right? One year on from South Africa's very groundbreaking deal, Indonesia landed possibly the biggest climate finance package in history. Um, so how was, again, this sort of J and JetP positioned within that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Buheli. Let me try to recollect my memories. Um, I think it, it happened, it started actually in April, so it's, it was over a year ago. It started in April 2022, and we had this negotiation happening so that it culminated in uh, G20 in, in Bali. So then we, we concluded the negotiation and then we released the joint statement. Um, it was really, uh, I think, as I think uh, um, Paramat, Mr. Deputy Minister, mentioned, it has been an, uh, an amazing journey. Uh, really, uh, we, everyone, every stakeholder learns a lot from all sides. And I think one of the things that we, uh, we learn from this is everyone uh, has the interest to make things better, including to make sure that we, don't, or we, we do not uh, uh, leave the just uh, aspect behind. And this means that just, that means fair. It is, uh, it is reflected in our joint statement. And of course, uh, for Indonesia part, at that time I was also uh, a member of the uh, negotiate, uh, negotiation team uh, for Indonesia's JETB, is uh, the importance that it's about opening up opportunities, uh, about livelihoods. So it should be, from Indonesia's point of view, it should be beyond mitigation, compensation. Yes, that is a must, but those are the bare necessities. We have to go beyond that. And hence, this is translated in our joint statement. And then this is also reflected in our investment plan that was launched uh, actually a week ago. Is it a week ago? Very fresh right, off the press. In Indonesia, yep. very fresh. Um, and in that, huh? Eh? The launch, yeah. Two weeks ago, yeah, before COP around so in Indonesia. And then um, we have in our uh, just transition chapter that we try to basically uh, uh, provide the framework 
for our aspiration, for this opportunity and livelihood, reflecting a joint statement through the exploration of a framework where we can introduce the economic diversification and transformation uh, that supports not only you know, uh, the local area affected, but also across the supply chain, across the value chain, so that it, this energy transition journey will open up opportunities for Indonesia to transform its economy, to, to diversify our economy, to make it more complex so that it can be the uh, ingredient, a strong, robust ingredient for our long-term sustainable economic development going forward. So that is uh, the plan. And now, after our investment plan is out, I apologize, I did not print the surround another 327 pages um, <laughs> with the list of projects. Um, I didn't, I haven't printed for myself. I think that might be thicker didn't. than the one Salim just <laughs> I, I don't even have a printed one for myself. <laughs> so uh, based on that, we would like to implement this going forward because we have the framework. But then again, the question is how to implement this at the project level yeah. and then how to make sure that this uh, plan, be it for the assessment and intervention stages uh, to support the just transition aspects, could be implemented uh, uh, in a synchronized way. And again, same question around participatory approach, right, which is at the heart of the J. So can you give us a sense of how that has gone in this sort of past 12, 14 months, very early days, but very critical formative period for the, yeah. for the Indonesia JP? Yes, it has been, again, a very, uh, uh, an adventure uh, with multiple stakeholders. So the participation, as uh, the Deputy Minister mentioned, uh, we have the supporting ecosystem for the JetBiz Tariat, that is the working groups, whereby we have the international organizations, uh, also the think tanks, be it from the national and international. And uh, that's one thing uh, in the process. And then we also have in-depth consultation with key stakeholders. We have over 200 in-depth discussions on the CIPP uh, content. And again, uh, we also have this international local expert contribution within the working group that I mentioned. And we also have these Keystone Public uh, uh, FGDs. Uh, of course, uh, the over 35 government of Indonesia's ministries engage in all of the uh, thematic working groups. And then we also have around one, over 100 CSOs engage in part of our public discussion. And we have full day events of uh, content discussion with uh, CSOs, including private uh, closed door sessions as well to explain the process, the content. And finally, uh, we have two weeks of public consultation um, before the launch. And uh, this includes uh, putting up the document, the CIPP, uh, for public uh, comments. And we produce the uh, two items from this. Number one is the summary of the public consultation and also the uh, comment metrics with the responses and then to show uh, how we incorporate, whether we can incorporate or whether we forward this to the government or whether you know, we cannot, but then we, we, we explain why. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's out of the scope of this. So we try to be as participatory as possible, as inclusive as possible. Is it perfect? Not, of course it's not perfect, but again, uh, Indonesia CIPP is a living document, yeah. and we will have this rolling every regularly, hopefully every month, periodically. Then you know we will uh, put uh, forth uh, the comments that we receive from the public from time to time. Especially, it will be even more important uh, because now we are in the implementation mode. So that's where all the you know all the the nasty pet peeves will be hiding, and then you know surprises. Then we have to be uh, together uh, in in doing this journey with the civil society and the businesses and everyone, uh, uh, especially from the Indonesia side. Thank you, thank you. And we'll come back to that absolutely, as you say, where the rubber really begins to hit the road. And I wanna first bring in our other two uh, panelists to, to sort of round out the conversation, starting with yourself, Crispian, uh, Dr. Crispian Olver from South Africa, uh, Executive Director of the, the Presidential Climate Commission. Um, I think worth reminding people that the PCC was established uh, you know, did establish, sorry, South Africa's very, just, very visionary just transition framework, uh, was the product of South Africa's very robust political economy, and the PCC sort of itself the, the product of the 2018 Jobs Summit, right? The, the foresight yes. of labor in seeing what was coming around the bend. 
So would love to hear from you what has been sort of the most challenging aspects of delivering on these quite ambitious justice commitments so far, and if you could just contextualize the PCC's role sure. a little bit as well. Uh, thank you, Haley, and a very good afternoon, everyone. Great to be with you in this discussion. So the Presidential Climate Commission was set up three years ago by the president. We're a multi-stakeholder body, and our job is to broker a social consensus around these very thorny questions about how we get to net zero, how we decarbonize the economy, how we build adaptation and resilience. Uh, so we're slightly independent of government. Government sits on our commission. Uh, we've got many ministers, including our energy minister. He's a very outspoken member. Um, and we have robust debates. And we, 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 we don't agree on everything, but we uh, allow all voices to come to the table. And that process is fundamentally important. So we've been very, you're following with a lot of interest what Joanne and her team are doing on the Jet IP. We've spent a lot of time discussing the Jet IP. We did an independent critique of it and we made recommendations back to the president about it. Um, and, you know, just to say we're broadly supportive of, of the work that they're doing. And uh, I think this implementation plan uh, that uh, Joanne and her team have just produced is really excellent. It's very detailed. I, I recommend that anyone uh, that wants to engages with it. So challenges, Hayley. Yeah. Um, and I want to start with a conceptual challenge. Uh, uh, I think the biggest problem we've had is different understandings of what we mean by a just transition mm. and a false perception that justice and ambition, uh, uh, there's a trade-off between them. So a lot of people have looked at developing countries push around just transitions as oh, they're trying to water down ambition. They're asking us to now invest in one or two other areas. It's distracting from the core climate problem that we have. Uh, I want to turn that completely on its head. Uh, the, the way that developing countries look at this transition, we look at it through the lens of our national development. And we're trying to calibrate the pace in order to optimize for development outcomes. And if we cannot ensure a just transition, we're not going to get ambition. Uh, the just transition is in many ways the key to unlocking the deal that brings these developing uh, countries into the global decarbonization project. So we see it as additive. You know, ambition and justice go hand in hand. They should not be set up in opposition to each other. Secondly, they're very different paradigms coming into this. And we found those paradigms of, are often, you know, there are boundaries between them and they're very difficult to break down. So, for instance, workers and large sectors of civil society look at the jet P and they look at the energy transition and they denounce it as a you know, wholesale privatization of our energy systems. We're basically taking the family silver and auctioning it off. Um, and it's all about rapacious profit and greed. That's one view. Um, uh, Governments tend to have a very technocratic view of the world. And uh, even the JetP team, I'm not including Joanne, let's say, <laughs> let's say her predecessors, you know, view this JetP process as a really complicated technocratic planning exercise. And it is. It's, you know, there's vast amounts of detailed investment planning and thinking and modeling. Um, uh, but that's not all that it is. You know, it's also got to be about an inclusive bottom-up process of enabling change 
and bringing people along on this transition. And the view on the ground in South Africa, and it's you know, partly our, I mean, I take some of the blame as the Climate Commission, people feel excluded. You know, they think that there are these elites cutting deals in back rooms, making the transitions being decided somewhere else, and they have all of the process if they ever had any part in it in the beginning. Um, I'm going to raise one last Please. obstacle. Uh, I, I mean, I've got a list, but I, I think let's keep the conversation going. The climate finance architecture that we have is not fit for purpose. Um, we've just finished a, a detailed report with CPI, by the way, um, uh, where we looked at finance flows into and out of our country. Two percent, 70, well, I mean, you know, the, the good news is 75% of those flows are coming from capital markets at commercial interest rates. Only 2% of those flows are concessional. If we want to start talking about just transition elements, we've got to scale up that concessional component by a couple of orders of magnitude. We've got 1% of grant money, uh, and grants have been falling as a percentage, and in Africa as a whole, grants dropped by 7% in 2022. Um, you're not going to get, you know, the just transition part of this deal, the projects are smaller, they've got much lower late, rates of return, they've got, you know, higher risk perceptions. If we want to start cranking this global financial system, uh, and gearing it up for just transitions, there's got to be some fundamental change. And that change has to start at the top. We have a set of global finance institutions that are governed by this elite cabal of developed countries. You know, elite multilateralism, that's basically the name of the game. Um, uh, that's the way the system works. Um, uh, uh, and if, if, if we're going to it in, uh, tackle it in any meaningful way, we've got to start discussing about the architecture itself and how it's governed. Thank you, Crispin. And I'm glad you came to finance because it's a perfect segue to our final speaker. Uh, Tiza Mafira is the Indonesia director at the Climate Policy Initiative, a, a very revered and, and um, deeply involved uh, think tank in Indonesia, but also globally on a, a mix of issues. So you've been doing a, a huge amount of technical support to try to make this financing real. Same question, really. What has been the most challenging aspect, the sort of lesson that you can elevate coming out of the last year or so? Thank you, Haley, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think the challenge, one of them is that uh, there is a notion that just is something that needs to be embedded as a safeguard into mm -hmm. projects, and therefore it's something that, uh, it, it's an injustice that will happen in the future that we have to prevent from happening by embedding safeguards. But from the perspective of developing countries and from the perspective of communities and grassroots workers, the injustice is already there. I mean, the status quo has many, many injustices, and that the energy transition actually is a, an opportunity to course correct uh, these injustices. Um, and so I, I, would, I would put forward three levels uh, of injustice and therefore three levels of just. And the first one is from the global north to the global south, and this is something that Parahmat um, um, explained uh, really uh, well in his analogy and his, his, his keynote speech. Um, the idea that the older sibling has to support its younger sibling because the older sibling has historically emitted so much more carbon emissions than the younger sibling. Um, and then the second level is the idea of just from the country to its people and that the reality is that there are inequalities already within a country and that an energy transition is actually an opportunity to correct those inequalities but at the other hand, it could also perpetuate those inequalities, right? And end up being same old, same old. Oh, these big companies are going to get all these renewable energy contracts and nothing goes, nothing trickles down. And the third level is uh, the idea that 
companies, companies to workers, right? Companies need to safeguard their, their workers' human rights, their workers' rights and benefits. And that even today, there are loopholes and that there are workers' rights that are circumvented. And the energy transition needs to follow best practices instead of the worst practice. And it needs to not exploit the loopholes that already exist. Now, the, ch the, the specific things that we see in JetP um, highlight these exact challenges. Because when we're talking about funding, right, from the global north to the global south, if we're talking about JetP funding, um, we do have to remember that the IPG funding is primarily an investment package. Um, out of the 10 or 11 billion from IPG, only $200 million is in the fr form of grants, more or less. Um, and um, what, you know, one of the one of the impacts of that is even if it's a concessional loan, even a concessional loan has requirements. Uh, loans will need to be channeled via MDBs. Uh, MDBs will require, in order to channel those loans, sovereign guarantees. And so the calculation for what the IPG funds might uh, impact to Indonesia's state budget is that Indonesia may have to set aside 8.4 billion dollars in sovereign guarantees in order to access those concessional loans, right? Um, and the other thing is that the MDBs will usually require a minimum ticket size. So it may be difficult, more difficult for SMEs, for example, to access this kind of financing. So that's an issue. I mean, I have many, many positive things to say about the JetP. It absolutely has accelerated uh, discussions and stakeholder um, uh, engagements that have, would, would not have happened you know, otherwise. It absolutely has increased, um, you know, helped increase Indonesia's detailed uh, ambitions to reach the energy transition. But what it is not is it is not a funding for socioeconomic transition. It's not a funding for socioeconomic transformation. Um, so I mean, that's a reality. And um, we, we, need to, we need to talk about that. Um, the government, on the other hand, also needs to play a role, right? We need to have uh, a, a national kind of socioeconomic transformation plan. Um, because if we're, if we're talking about what is needed to correct those inequalities, then there needs to be a plan that's comprehensive and that embeds the energy transition as a tool to correct those inequalities. So we're talking about what kinds of livelihoods that are upcoming that we need to support from now. Uh, what kind of um, tr regional transformations would be impacted, who would suffer fiscally, as in cities or regions would <laughs> suffer fiscally and would need to be supported by central to subnational fiscal transfers, for example. Uh, but also, what are the, you know, obviously there are benefits, health benefits from coal, closing down coal plants, economic transformation opportunities, but these need to be costed, all of these need to be costed so that they can be supported. And finally, with the companies, the reality is that companies are not going to go beyond what the law requires. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that they need to be part of the conversation. They need to, we need to know what they understand about what the law requires and whether that law already covers the kind of worker protection that we envisage. So it's a lot. Yeah. It is a lot, it is a lot. And if I can ask a follow-up, um, a little bit in the stead of our GFAN's friend who was uh, pulled away at the last minute, but that is already an innovation in the JetP model, this um, global Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, a, a, a large grouping of private financial institutions match funding Indonesia's partnership. Um, you've talked about the sort of dimensions of project level safeguards that, that they will come into this from their perspective, right? That, that is what they see as, as the J, is that right? Or, or how are you seeing the role of GFANS playing out around this, this J and JetP within Indonesia? Well, the GFANS are financial institutions. They'll be coming in with the commercial loan uh, portion of the funds. And um, they absolutely you know, say that they will be, and, and I'm not saying this as in they're, not, they're only saying it, but from their perspective, right? They of course are absolutely committed to following the safeguards, the best, uh, the, the, the laws that, the, that are required uh, in the country. Um, and um, so the way that the, the CIPP, actually the CIPP talks about just transition, after a lot of back and forth, 
discussions as to what is actually the coverage of just transition and who finances what. So there was a lot of discussion around who finances what because um, if we tally up the costs and the costs are quite high, of course there's going to be this discussion, right? So we ended up, the, the investment plan ended up with this sort of, this sort of pyramid structure where at the bottom we have Indonesian laws, right? We have environmental safeguards, we have uh, environmental uh, protection laws, uh, worker protection laws that are already mandated by Indonesia. Absolutely, <coughs> financial institutions will follow that and respect that. Uh, the middle of the pyramid has um, best practice lender safeguards, best practice MDB safeguards. So the ADBs and the World Banks, they're coming in and saying, we already have great environmental social safeguards, which we always use. These are best practice. Um, this has already has you know, human rights uh, considerations embedded within that. Uh, and so financial institutions will say, great, we will consider those as well. Right? We, want to, we want to follow best practice. But then there's just, just transition. This is, this is what happens to communities around the coal plant. What happens to um, a coal region who's no longer able to get fiscal income from taxing whatever coal production it had relied upon, right? Who's going to cover that? That's not, that's not covered by ESS. That's not covered by Indonesian laws. Who's going to cover upskilling and reskilling of workers so that they're ready to, you know, to, to be part of the new uh, economy of that region. So nobody's covering that. And I think that is what was identified as additional, the additionality that, that, is, that we can define as just transition. And nobody's financing that yet. That is quite the challenge to, I'm I wanna sort of weave in a final question just to go across the panel and as I do that, firstly signal that we do want to ensure lots of time for question uh, in this audience. There's, I think, going to be a lot of curiosity, a lot of um, interest in, in different facets that we've covered in a very quick period of time. So get your questions uh, ruminating um, as I ask the panel a final one, which is that we've heard a lot around the complexity, um, the challenges of perception, how justice is defined, how you therefore package that within these quite technical processes in the beginning, um, the difficulties and challenges of actually concretely including those most affected in those processes, right? It's a very live process of multi-level social contract, as you sort of said, Tisa. So uh, my question is one really around quality control, because these are partnerships that are holding up the J and saying this is a just energy transition partnership, and it is a process. So how, how do we approach this question of quality control over time, over this multi-decades process? Do you have a sense of the mechanisms, Joanne and Edo, that are, that are being embedded in these partnerships and uh, Crispian and, and Tiza, are you seeing those as effective enough? Maybe we can start with yourself, Edo, about how you're approaching this question of, of quality control around the J. Yeah. Um, so for quality control, uh, our approach is basically uh, we have to make things transparent. So given the uh, ecosystem that we built here yeah, for Indonesia's JetB, what the Secretariat will do is basically do some sort of uh, meta-monitoring of things progressing, uh, how things are progressing, and how, for instance, the projects are adhering to the uh, just transition uh, standards and principles that we laid in the, in the uh, CIPP. That's one thing. Now. The second thing that is even more important is how people will, I mean, how every single stakeholder will change after JetP. Yeah. Because it, is, it has always been my view that uh, the life should be different before and after JetP. If everyone still does the, what we do the same, then there is no point of having this thing. So everyone has to change. And this includes how every stakeholder can synchronize the process in ensuring the just transition aspects, um, which of course include uh, from the financiers, from the lender side. So now we have s different channels, right? So for instance, like for uh, uh, every allocation yeah, of the financing, yeah, it's this investment package, and then we will do this in financing maybe through one uh, agency or different agencies. Every single agency has 
different uh, ways of doing this. They have different uh, standards, those kind of things. Mm. So now the challenge is for everyone uh, to ask the questions, what can we do differently? So if we can synchronize these things, it will make the met met meta monitoring also easier because we have the synchronization on the standards. And then we can see that this serves also uh, the aspiration of the host country. Uh, in, this, in this case, is for the case of Indonesia, where we can also take a look at the uh, potential as our aspiration to diversify and transform our economy. So that is how we should do the quality control. And this really takes uh, uh, everyone to, to really uh, put their chips on the table to see how we can do things differently. Because the fact is like what um, uh, Ibutiza and, and Dr. Oliver already mentioned, right? We, uh, it's, it's just the, that we have to accept that there are not so many, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, man, uh, power uh, for the just transition here. Right. They're not not so much in in our bag, yeah, in our as, as the ammunition. So we have to think a bit more creatively. That's one. And how to increase this? And number two is how to make the mechanism uh, change a bit differently, so that people know that this is something is different. Something has changed after the announcement of all the jet piece, after all this, the investment plans are out, people will, uh, all stakeholders, yeah, especially, because look, if we'll, we'll do things differently. Like for instance, yeah, I received many comments from our public consultation on communi community-based uh, energy uh, projects, for instance. Can we do that through jet piece? I think Tiza's explanation already answers that. Mm. Because there is a minimum tickets for this. Can we do that? Well, I don't have the answer. So this is the answer that everyone has, has, has to, uh, it's like a problem set. So we have to sit together. It's a group to work together and then, and then find a solution for this kind of thing. Yeah. So this is the, the challenge because community-based projects might be, I mean, it is important. But can we do it through this chat people? It's a problem set. Yeah. We have to sit together. We know that's a problem. And as, as this is that, and you know, we have to just find a solution for this. That's an example. And I think at the heart of that really is capacitation, right, of government, of the deep knowledge that will be required across industries to break these silos, to invest deeply in the J, um, but also flipping the coin to capacitation of communities, workers, unions, um, and others that are going to be affected that, that have voice but need to... Uh, be given a seat at the table and need to be capacitated to be able to, to, to sort of speak on the, on the terms and levels of the JetP itself. But Joanne, I want to come to you as well on this question of quality <coughs> control. How, you know, what mechanisms, what ways in which are you looking to really safeguard the J over time? Okay, okay. I think um, there is a, a technical response and there's a much more political organizational response, yeah. we'll call it organizational. So I, I think the first thing that, that we've done in our implementation plan is that we started off by building a theory of change for each of the different portfolios um, of, the, of, of our jet uh, process, uh, whether it's the electricity sector, green hydrogen, electric vehicles, municipalities, skills development, there's a theory of change that has been built that looks at, um, I suppose, what are the inputs, what are the activities, what are the outputs, what does it feed into, what are the outcomes, and then how does all of that collectively add, feed into the impact. And that then is um, underpinned by monitoring and evaluation framework. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's the kind of technical system that I think you probably need to have is to be able to map out the process of change and then be able to say how do we measure it and what are we measuring in, 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 in that process. But I think that importantly to be able to do that, um, you need to have the buy-in from mm -hmm. a wide set of stakeholders who then can align their activities to the jet P. You know, so whether it's a company investing in renewables we want to know that they're doing it, but we also then want to be able to challenge them to say, how are you going to support your fence line community? And so there's, a, there's quite a big data collection alignment issue that I think is part of the answer. And then the last 
but definitely not least side of it is what does one do in order to support communities and workers on the ground to be able to see themselves as part of the process yeah. and to be able to see themselves as agents of change and to be able to say there are things we want to do that are aligned to the jet that will improve our lives, that will create jobs, that will um, address pollution issues, whatever it is. And here, here is what we need in order to be able to do that. So I think there is this issue of quality control, a large part of it is about an organizational infrastructure that has to be built that can then feed in and align. For, for me, the last part of this is around the public discourse. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to be able to measure the conversation that is happening in the world out there. Um, and I think that that ultimately is where fundamentally you're going to be able to assess um, the views of the country in relation to whether this is something that people see as worthwhile. And, and, and I think that in this very social media governed world that we live in, it's also a critical element of being able to understand the quality of change. Yeah. Not necessarily always accurate, but it's an important litmus test. And, and again, a good segue to yourselves, particularly you, Crispian, I think this question of quality control and agency, I mean, what, was, what is your metric for that? How do, how do we know when we're doing that well? Yeah. So, you know, the most important thing, I think, is transparency. Um, we need to have line of sight on these funds how they're being utilized, how they're linked to project outputs. And that needs to be bedded down into clear institutional mechanisms. So uh, a project clearing house, <coughs> online tracking, uh, people want to be able to see this in real time, uh, understand how projects are being selected and where funds are flowing to. So, so that's first and foremost, uh, you know, and it's, it's a good point to make this, um, uh, to, to emphasize this, because, you know, we're, uh, the negotiations are discussing now this enhanced transparency framework. Uh, uh, it's very important that countries open up their climate planning and, you know, we, uh, we want to see inside the black box, basically. Uh, secondly, I mean, I do want to reinforce what Joanne was saying about M&E systems. Mm. So, you know, M&E for just transitions is very much still in its infancy. Um, some of it we're very familiar with. I mean, like broader SDG tracking, I think that's been highly well developed, you know, looking at uh, poverty, inequality, human health, education levels. Um, but there's a set of indicators much closer to what we're trying to do with the just transition. Jobs in new green economy sectors, skills for the future labor force, social protection measures. Um, uh, we, we, you know, we're needing to develop a set of indicators that track all of that, uh, as well as the softer governance stuff uh, th that you raised. Um, and then lastly, I mean, I do think it's important to pick sort of indicator cases and go into a little bit more depth mm. about them. And um, we've just, you know, as the Climate Commission, for instance, we uh, selected the, one of our power stations has recently been decommissioned, Kamati Power Station. Um, it's actually not part of the Jet IP package but it's very much a, a sort of early pilot of this whole just transition push. So we've gone in there in depth, we've done a number of visits, we've engaged stakeholders and communities, we've talked to ESCOM and the province and the local authorities, and we've done a detailed assessment of, you know, how does this measure up? Where, where have things really worked? And, you know, we've dished out the love to the extent that it needs to be dished out. But, you know, where have we fallen short? What didn't work? How can we improve next time that we go? And I think those little places where you go in depth into a particular issue really help. You, you get a lot of meaningful uh, results out of it. 
And it is around sharing out those challenges, where it actually gets messy, where there are trade-offs that maybe weren't navigated yeah. well or correctly and, and can be learned from, yeah. absolutely. So want to bring in audience questions, but Tisa, this question of, of metrics, of quality, obviously, is, in your, is, is your bread and butter in many ways. Um, I mean, your metric for, for quality control around the J. Um, before going into metrics, you know, I think based on best practices, I think we should have a just transition fund. Um, we've seen coal plants getting closed in other countries. Um, and uh, yeah, for example, the best practice of Hazel, Hazelwood plant in Australia, where there was a $600 million fund that was rolled out, public funds that were rolled out to support um, worker uh, uh, reskilling and upskilling and to support uh, funds for investments and in communities and new jobs and infrastructure and environmental restoration. And we also hear cases in Germany, for example, where in Brandenburg there was a coal plant that was closed down. $700 million was rolled out in public funds, including funds for small medium enterprises and funds for schools and vocational training. So there was funding in that case, in, the, in that sense. And the EU has a, has a just transition fund. Um, we need to talk about the potential for having funds like this because they can, they can be a pool. They can be a pool of funds that can leverage more funding. And more funding is, is what we need at the moment. We mm -hmm. do not, we, we, what we know for sure is that we do not yet have the funding for what we need uh, for, the, for the just transition. Um, but funding, having a fund also means that we can talk about the governance of the fund mm. and we can talk about the KPIs of the fund and what kind of metrics we, of impact we want to see from the usage of such funds that is very, you know, specifically tailored to just transition and, and equity elements, right, which, which we may not see right now from existing uh, pools of fund. So I think that's one thing. And the second thing that I... Um, um, and gleaning for, for, from the best practices is that it is absolutely important to support community-based renewables um, because mm -hmm. that means that you are elevating communities from being a stakeholder to a shareholder. And that means that you're not involving them just to make sure that they're not angry, right, at whatever change is happening, but you're involving them because you want them to be absolutely excited about the change that's coming because they absolutely have skin in the game, right, um, and they, they get to benefit from it. So, um, I mean, CPI has done work. We've, we've assessed these community-based renewables in Indonesia. We've assessed, you know, the, the financial viability of cooperative models, of village-owned uh, enterprise models, of... Um, you know, central, uh, central government subsidy models. And there are many diverse community-based renewables models that could work, but are not supported systematically yet. Um, and I think having a dedicated fund could help that systematic support for community-based renewables. I think a lot of people are starting to ask these questions around a fund, institutionalization of this uh, in a way that capacitates um, I, I want to bring in the audience now. If you do have questions, raise your hand, please. And I see a few going up. We do have a roving mic. Um, so I, I'll, I'll try to take a round of three or four, uh, if I can right now. I see four, so let's go with four for now. I've got you in the second round. What we'll try to do are sort of lightning answers if we can, because it would be great to do, yep, it would be great to do two rounds if we can. So if you could keep them short, but introduce yourself briefly. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lauren Hermanis of Southern Transitions. Uh, thank you to the panelists for your valuable contributions. So I think it's incredible that you've all positioned JetP as a catalytic package that's also about opening opportunities and not just about mitigating uh, risks. Um, so how do we think about this, though, when this catalytic potential or transformational potential plays out in the context of constraints that severely inhibit that transformation. And I'm thinking of things like, for example, the World Trade Organization trade regime. Uh, but there are many others. And yeah, thank you. And we'll keep going. So bear that question in mind around constraints. Uh, my name is Douglas Beal. I'm with Boston Consulting Group. And thank you. For, that was a great panel. Look, I'm very supportive of the just transition, but I'm going to ask a couple of kind of provocative questions. I think one would be, 
you know, innovation has caused winners and losers and people to lose their jobs for centuries. How is this different? Is it just because we're more enlightened now and so we're trying to do something about it? And I think the second is that, I think one of you made the comment, we can't use, we can't rely on this to solve all the world's social problems. So then the question is, what percent of the world's social problems could be exacerbated or improved by climate transition? Is it 1% or is it 25%? If it's 25%, this is a pretty damn important question. If it's one, do we just get on with solving social problems and we don't worry about it in the context of climate? Thank you, Doug. Let's take two more. We got a lot of hands. Um, sorry? I got to choose. I, I think I saw in the back come up relatively early on. Hola, soy Soledad Mella, soy waste speaker de Chile. Represento la voz de 20 millones de waste speaker. Um, hello, I'm Soledad Mella. I'm from Chile. I represent 20 million well, 20 million people that is earning livelihoods with waste speaking <coughs> in Latin America. <coughs> eh, cuando se habla de transición justa y de los procesos que se están viviendo a nivel global, Creo que es importante involucrar a los actores que han sido vulnerados durante mucho tiempo. Uh, when we are talking about just transition, it's very important to include these stakeholders that have been marginalized for so many years. Se habla de triple impacto climático y nosotros los white speakers hablamos de triple aporte climático. Um, we are talking about the impact of climate change, and we, way speakers, we are talking about the contribution that we make to climate change mitigation. Nuestro impacto es social, es económico y es climático. A través de nuestro trabajo hemos logrado impactar por mucho tiempo sin tener una cuantificación y sobre todo sin tener un pago por lo que hemos hecho. Um, we have contributed to climate change mitigation for a long time without being paid for our service, which is one of our demands. We are demanding to be paid for the service that we are doing. Para nosotros es clave saber cómo se va a involucrar realmente a la sociedad civil, a los más vulnerables, a los más pobres entre los pobres en esta transición justa que va a impactar justamente a los despojados y a los vulnerados. It is a key question to know precisely how the most vulnerable communities will be included in all these processes, how the, the most marginalized, the most impacted, how are they going to be included in all this just transition process? Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll go one last question here, and then we'll come to the panel. Second round. Thanks very much. My name's Connor. I'm Thank a, you. My name's Connor. I'm a carbon auditor. Um, uh, it's quite similar to your question. Um, uh, well, the sort of percentages uh, part of it. And just on the sort of sheer interconnectedness of society mm. uh, and justice issues, how do you start to draw the boundary around what the jet peak scope is and what it isn't? I imagine if you don't draw these boundaries, then all of a sudden every single social issue gets dropped at the door of the jet peak. Are uh, there sort of high level rules of thumb for deciding this? And then in the South African context, for example, like the grid infrastructure, is that sort of part of the part of the yeah, the JP. Thank you. So a lot to cover there. We've got sort of how to deal with global constraints, essentially kind of undermining uh, everything. Scope, are we overloading the bridge by trying to address everything within this partnership? Um, how, why will this be any different? Uh, we've, we've gone through these processes before and, and failed quite miserably. And also, I think transformation, going from a, a, a normal sort of reality of informality to one where there's actual inclusion uh, and, and formalization of that. So uh, I'll, again, we'll maybe go down the panel, starting with Pa Edo. Uh, if we can keep it uh, relatively short, sharp, I would love to take another round of questions. Do I have to, ask, do, uh, to answer? So, no, absolutely not. <laughs> just, just pick one, I think, that really speaks to you. OK. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to start with the, uh, with the boundary said, uh, you know, the last questions. I think it's really important to make sure that actually uh, the JetP, the partnership, is simply, let's uh, say, uh, catalytic, and it's, it's part of the journey of the host country. Let's say for Indonesia, uh, it's the largest, as we know, uh, of the commitment, yeah, 
uh, 20 billion. But what we need even until 2030, just to follow the JetP Indonesia's trajectory that we, we model in our technical, we're going to need close to 100, around 97.2 billion. So we have to, to, to see this as, the, as part of, and if it's like a book, it's like chapters. So it has to be following the aspiration of the country. So when the boundary is very clear, the boundary is very clear here. In the CIPP, we have the JETP projects. Um, and then, uh, but in the, the plan, it will be the Indonesia's plan and where JETP is part of those. So that will be the boundary of, you know, and JETP is of course consisting of our IPG friends and GFANS friends. So those are the boundaries very clear from that side. Mm. And uh, the second are vulnerable communities. So what we have been trying uh, to do, what we, we always uh, try to do uh, all the time, at least for the Indonesia part, is first to accommodate them, to, to sit, listen. Because if we don't uh, listen to them, then we can't really know what is happening on the ground. So that is what we are trying to do. And we have actually already set the, all the mechanisms. But of course, because JP is partnership and we are accountable for things that are um, pledged yeah, and within under the pledge of JetP, then we have to make sure that those things that are related to, to JetP, uh, we accommodate this, uh, the list of these vulnerable communities, including for the major groups and other stakeholders. So that is part. And everyone can see uh, as transparent as possible. We need to have this regular consultation. Uh, again, it's impossible to, to get 100% uh, correct all the time. Everyone can be, you know, uh, uh, a bull's eye all the time, but at the very least, the process uh, should be as inclusive and as participatory as possible. That's what we, we, we've been trying to do. And for the innovations, losers from the BCG uh, colleagues, uh, uh, basically, yeah, it's, uh, you know, this is, uh, the shift towards low carbon economy is, uh, it will happen. It's a secular trend, it will happen anyway. And actually, the way we see this uh, jet B is, kind of like a catalyst here to make sure a conductor, uh, to make sure that this could help Indonesia in that process so that we can prepare ourselves uh, because there will be losers, but we want to go beyond that, not only compensate the losers, but also to make sure that's why in our standard, uh, in our just transition standard, we want to see the transformation, how we can uh, 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 leverage the potential from this jet key. To, to create a plan that will improve our competitiveness in the future. And then this will also mean that we can create green jobs. If you read the joint statement, Indonesia, one of this is industrial innovation, to create green jobs. That is the first phrase that is mentioned in Indonesia's uh, JP joint statement. Um, that is actually is very clear that, so that is our aspiration. And that's, we, that's what we uh, will try to do to make this, this is also reflected in our investment focus areas. Uh, part of the manufacturing. So that will be, and for the global constraints, uh, I think I will leave uh, this for the others. That's a perfect hand up for Joanne. The global <laughs> constraints, go ahead and solve that problem okay. for us. Um, yeah, I, I'm not certain I'm gonna, okay. So, so my approach to global constraints is that um, we, we live in an, an unequal world with a set of unequal power relations and structures. And we work within that, and we need to find, find ways forward within that context. So I suppose um, my own theory of change is you look for the gaps, and you look for the space, and you move forward. Um, and to the extent that there are worldwide movements around these issues, you see that change. But your ability, I think, to, to influence some of those is fairly indirect. I, I think that. In terms of the scope issue, I think we need to, for ourselves, understand why, why, the, why is this important for South Africa? And it's partly about climate impact and the risks we face as a country from climate change and the fact that we have to address it. But it's on the other hand, the fact that we are a large global emitter and the geography from where those emissions are generated is fairly contained. Mm. It's contained in a coal belt of about 10 or 15 towns and about 15 power stations that are all in a fairly concentrated geographical area. 
Many of those power stations are coming to the end of life anyway. The country has a serious energy, energy supply deficit. And so change is inevitable. Something has got to give in that situation. And in terms of the just transition, what we need to do is to be able, and I mean, I suppose you could look at it as a social experiment, look at that geographical area, look at those people, look at the things that are going to happen, the inevitable changes that are going to come upon those communities, and you're going to say, are we going to leave them, or are we going to try and put in place a set of investments and interventions at a range of levels, financial, organisation, infrastructural, that are going to give those people a fighting chance on the one hand, but demonstrate that climate-friendly um, development is something that really can generate a future for people. So I think, you know, so the scope kind of almost describes itself uh, mm -hmm. once you start to look at it. And if you look at the three areas we've spoken about, it's the coal workers, it's the automotive workers, and it's the potential of green hydrogen that really directs us to areas for intervention and geographies where we think investments are going to make a, a, a really positive, a, a really positive uh, difference. Just on, on, on the waste picker, on the waste picker issue, we see kind of waste. Waste management is a big issue in our country, um, and I really wish that our minister had been here uh, for the session because she has worked quite extensively with the waste picking community in South Africa and with the paper industry around putting in place the infrastructure that allows waste pickers to be able to be build a partnership with the industry that allows them to make a living. But I don't know, I mean, yeah, so just to, Thank you. to acknowledge that. And so, Tisa Crispian, if you'll allow me, because there are a lot of hands and a lot of interest, I think. So I'd love to take another round of questions, but put you on the spot a little bit to, to take them and field them, if that's all right, unless you're urging want, to come back to, to one I wanted to take on Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> Please, what? briefly, and then we'll go to questions once more. Well, I, I mean, I think you're correct. We're, we're talking about a transition that's of the order of magnitude of the, the great economic revolutions, industrial mm -hmm. information age. Mm. And it certainly is going to create winners and losers. Uh, hopefully we've learned something since the industrial revolution. Um, and that is that if we don't proactively manage this, we're going to wind back the development gains that the world's seen over the last century. And the critical difference is that the, the political economy of this transition, I mean, we, we need a coordinated set of regulatory and investment and economic decisions. And that requires us to play in the realm of political economy. And we will not get the political economy of this transition right if it's not just. Do you, okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, a friend of mine once said, um, you know, uh, when horses were replaced by cars, were subsidies and compensation <laughs> provided to the horses, you know? And I, I actually don't know whether horse owners were compensated or not, but I'm sure the horses are healthier and happier now. Um, but, you know, the difference between now and then is that we have a deadline. Uh, we have a deadline of 2030 uh, to turn things uh, around. Um, we do not have the luxury of just waiting for the market to sort itself out. Um, and uh, as it stands today, uh, CPIs uh, al always uh, tracked uh, climate finance. Uh, this year, climate finance has exceeded $1 trillion. Um, however, uh, the amount of fossil fuel subsidies still flowing is $7 trillion. And so, you know, the horses are fighting back. Um, and so it is quite an uphill climb, and we really need to, to make sure that there, you know, um, there, are, there are incentives are in place uh, for this to happen. Well said. So we're going to take another round. I'm going to be brave because we have five minutes left. There's a, we'll, we'll focus on this side of the room, although this gentleman here has been very eager. So we'll take a very quick question from this gentleman. Um, please keep them short. And what we'll do is come to the panel, and really, it's just a one-minute uh, flash 
the sort of final takeaway that you want to either answer a question or leave everyone with. But I at least want to give everyone the chance to, to feed these questions to these leaders on these issues. Brief. Yeah, I would be very quick. So I'm Samba Fal from Enda Energy. Hi, and I would, I would be very pleased to, 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 to join this meeting. But I would like to first uh, tap in, uh, as you said, the m and system for the JetP is, is in, in, in infancy. So should it be only a top-down or how to make sure that mm. the non-state actors are part of it? And my second question is, uh, since we are on, uh, the JetP is just a catalytic approach, so to what extent industry and agricultural sector uh, get into the business? And how really the national innovation or domestic innovation is being developed? Since, like, I would like to hear really from Indonesia or uh, uh, South Africa, how you put to, uh, on the front the national innovation system during the JetP. Thank process. you, Sandra. Thank you. And for anyone curious about Senegal's JetP, that is uh, the gentleman to talk to. So let's go over to this side of the room. We'll take three questions, very brief. Um, starting at the front, and then we'll head to the back. Hi. Hi. Yes. Okay, now it's working. So hi, I'm Natalia from the Business and Human Rights Research Center. Thank you, everyone, for their insights. They have been extremely interesting. Um, on our latest edition of the Renewable Energy Benchmark, which evaluate 28, policy, 28 companies' policies on human rights, we realized that only two companies have explicit references to respecting indigenous people's rights. And at the same time, only two companies have explicit references to um, respecting land rights. At the same time, we have, as part of our uh, just transition energy principles, the fact that the energy transition, a just energy transition, should include shared prosperities, um, making sure that those who have been for a long time um, carrying the weight of um, a fossil fuel-based economy are able to uh, thrive in the context of the just transition. Um, that being said, we would like to know if what are the specific uh, plans for shared disparity, co-equity, shared benefits models under uh, just transition, just energy transition partnerships, and what might be the barriers in terms of access to finance. Thank you. Thank you. Picking up on that community-based renewables uh, piece we were talking about earlier. We had one more question in the back. Hi, um, thank you for your inputs. My name is Troy Hernandez from ITUC International Trade Union Confederation Asia Pacific. So um, yesterday at the ILO Just Transition Pavilion at the high level meeting, we've heard about the case of South Africa and how trade unions have been involved in the Jet IP. So I'm curious about uh, the same in Indonesia. How have been trade unions been involved in the process? And to what extent are their inputs considered and accommodated in the CIPP? And um, for us, trade unions, trust transition, key principle is about having workers and unions at the table through social dialogue. Thanks. Thank you. So we'll start with you, Tisa, if we can, and, and use this as your opportunity, really, for kind of a final one-minute wrap-up as well. But feel free to pick up on any of those questions. Yeah, I think there were a lot of questions around uh, access uh, to the finance for communities, marginalized communities, ba the barriers, and how, how to make sure that the trade unions are involved, the, the, you know, the marginalized communities are involved. Um, the, what the JetP has, what the JetP has set out as its first milestone, essentially, is this investment plan, right? And of course, the process for the investment plan needs to be inclusive, it needs to be participatory, it needs to include stakeholders, but the output itself is an investment plan, mm. which means that it's a pretty tough language. I mean, I haven't even read the whole 300 <laughs> pages. Baedo hasn't printed the whole document yet. Um, it is dense. Yeah. It is dense. It is technical. It is extremely difficult to get through, um, and we can't put that, we can't publish that and expect communities to understand that and everybody to understand that. It's not inclusive language, um, and it's not meant to be. I mean, it's meant to showcase how oh, these are the financial structures. These are what is going to make your ROI acceptable to you as a financier. Um, and so we need to have, you know, something else, like something that's tailored to um, communities. And this, this, this needs to be defined. What is this process called? And what is the language that we use for this process? Um, and how do we make sure that the language is the language that is understood uh, and easily accessible to everyone that we need to have 
uh, on board with this. You know, um, I don't think we've discussed that enough. No. Yeah. yeah. Agree. Crispian, final word. So, on the issue of shared prosperity, um, uh, I, I mean, I, I think it's an important plank of this whole thing. We, we've been particularly interested in ownership models linked to the energy transition. And, uh, you know, know that we can't, it can't simply be that we entirely outsource our entire energy generation system to IPPs. Uh, what we've got to be actively doing in this transition is exploring alternative ownership models and looking at ways to bring workers and communities into that. Um, we've had a little bit of an experience with uh, this renewable energy procurement program we've been running in South Africa. It's, it's worked fairly well, although there's been a little bit of a stop start around it, and there are community shares linked to that, which uh, have brought some benefits to local communities. I'm talking about a much bigger scale of intervention where communities entirely own and, and run these power plants um, and potentially do it by linking up co-ops and townships uh, with solar uh, rooftop rollout. So it's an area we have made recommendations on and uh, there's also a chapter in the JET IP that talks about that. So. We're quite pleased with that. And we now need to move from recommendations to, to roll out. Yeah. 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 So Joanne, on that point. OK. Um, let me talk uh, to the question around um, innovation and um, also the non-state actors. Uh, um, I think that if you, look at, if you look at the implementation plan that we developed, we spent a lot of time talking to people in the various industry and sectors that we are, are, are looking at. Um, and really, a lot of them are startups. Um, a lot of them are companies um, that are testing and piloting new models, uh, particularly in things like the hydrogen, green hydrogen. A, a lot of them are piloting, uh, for example, the rollout of charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Um, solar-powered charging, charging infrastructure. Our sense is that there is significant innovation but not much structured support in our country. And one of the things that we would want to do going forward is to look at how you start to pull that together so that you get that entrepreneurial, innovative, risk-taking, um, and quite fabulous uh, initiatives that are happening at a very micro scale and be able to pull them together in order that you can look at firstly directing a better scale of finance and support into them um, and particularly patient capital, early stage, early stage um, concessional finance that would allow them to get going much more quickly in order that you can benefit from them. So I think it's a, it's, it's a concern. Um, I think that South Africa sits in a situation at the moment where it's very, has quite significant fiscal constraints. Um, the government spend on R&D has, uh, has been reducing rather than increasing. And I suppose the question is to what extent can the JP in these sectors be used as a way to turn that around again. Thank you, Joanne. Apologies to interrupt, but we've taken already five minutes from the next session, so um, we will need to end the session now. Thank you, and Edo, to be continued, everyone, thank you for your time. It was a lively discussion. Please engage with these leaders moving forward.